Uh, Pastor Larry asked me to talk about fruitfulness and ministry. And so another reason why I wanted to introduce myself is to kind of qualify what I'm saying. I have been blessed to be a part of a fruitful ministry for the majority of my life. And I'm entering a phase in, in my own life where I'm able to now produce some of that fruit myself. And I, I, I say that the Lord is producing it through me. You know what I mean. So uh, the opportunity to produce a, a fruitful outcome for the kingdom of God is something that is, um, it goes beyond a personal goal or ambition. And I think that we have a, in the capital C church, in the, the worldwide church, we have a lot of ambitious men and women, uh, but we need men and women who are ambitious with a pure motive. Does that make sense? And we need to make sure that we're building the Lord's kingdom and not our own kingdom. And so fruitfulness speaks to that because it is only the work of the Holy Spirit in a life through Jesus Christ where you can begin to produce real fruit. Your gifts and your talents can carry you and cause you to produce a reaction from people or cause people to want to engage in your ministry or whatever it is that you're doing. But the work of God in you through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus, is the only thing that truly produces biblical fruit in your life. So if you don't mind, I, I'd like, I'm, I'm kind of a teacher by nature. Um, my, my earliest roles in ministry were in a teaching role. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach a little bit, and then I hope to engage maybe with some questions or anything that you might have. So I'm going to try to keep an eye on the time as well as we do that. So I just want to talk about a biblical concept of fruitfulness. Because it is most often easiest for us as the church to celebrate giftedness over fruitfulness. Amen? Because giftedness is more tangible. It's more visible. Right? We can have a great service on Sunday. I don't know how your church is, but, you know, we're, we're Pentecostal at our church. So we, we have a high energy service, right? So it's far easier for us to walk out of a Sunday morning service and say, man, the Lord was there because people were crying, people were laying in the floor, people were shouting and doing all the Pentecostal stuff, speaking in tongues, right? It's easy to celebrate those things as opposed to walking out and celebrating how much the love of God was there, how much the joy of the Lord was in the place, how much faith was built in the place, right? The, those, those nine fruits that are listed in Galatians chapter 5, they're not as tangible as somebody's great ability to speak or to sing or to pray for somebody. So I believe the Lord wants us to explore this concept of, of biblical fruitfulness. So if you've got your Bibles, let's go to Matthew chapter 13, okay? Uh, Matthew chapter 13, just for some context, is a great teaching chapter. Jesus teaches through parables um, in, this, in this chapter. Some of the most famous parables that he ever tells are in Matthew 13. A parable is an earthly story that communicates a heavenly truth or principle. It's a metaphor, a physical metaphor for a spiritual reality, all right? Um, where we're going to pick up, we're going to pick up in Matthew uh, 13, 18, okay, verse 18. And this is actually a, an explanation of a parable that Jesus has just told. We call it the parable of the sower, all right? So just a brief synopsis of the parable. Jesus says, a sower went out to sow, and he cast out seed, and some of that seed fell by the wayside. Some of that seed uh, fell upon stony ground. Some of that seed fell upon thorny ground. And some of it fell upon good ground. Now the disciples come to Jesus after he, he tells the parable, and they ask him, explain this to us. We don't, we don't understand what you mean. So in verse 18, he says, listen to the parable of the sower. Verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one sown with seed by the road, or the wayside, we call it, right, beside the road. Verse 20, the one sown with seed on the rocky places, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet, no, uh, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution occurs because of the word, immediately he falls away. The third example, verse 22. The one sown with seed among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word and the anxiety of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And then the fourth, but the one sown with seed on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, 
who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty times as much. Okay? So I, Jesus is illustrating to us concepts of fruitfulness. All right? The Word of God is powerful. The Word of God is, is sharper than any two-edged sword, the Bible says. It can divide into your soul and your spirit. And so the Word of God is effective wherever it lands. In each of these occasions, the Word of God, wherever it lands, has power. All right? Whether it's by the wayside, whether it's in the thorns or upon the stones or in the good ground, the Word is powerful. The seed of the Word of God is powerful. One of the most important, I would say the most important elements in your personal journey toward fruitfulness in the kingdom of God, is your connection to the Word. Amen? The Word of God. If you do not know the Word of God, you cannot produce fruitfulness in the kingdom of God. You can't be fruitful in your ministry if you don't know the Word. The Word is what brings forth fruit. The Word is the seed. Okay? So regardless of the type of ground that your life may be, without that Word, you will not produce anything. Now, we see in the examples here that there's an evil one who comes and snatches it away. We see that, that you have to have roots that, that go down deep so that you can withstand pressure and persecution. We see that uh, there's an opportunity for anxiety and wealth to choke out what the Word wants to do. But regardless of, of what comes against the Word, the Word itself is powerful. So if you want to produce fruit, you must have the Word in you. You must know the Word. You need to know this Word better than you know any other thing, okay? If you get this word in you, you will produce something. There will be things that come. There will be things that try to steal from you, to snatch it away, to choke you out, okay? There will be things that try to keep you from putting roots down. And, and I want to say this. Psalm 92 promises us that if we, will, if we will be planted in the courts of our God, we will flourish, amen? It is impossible for you to produce fruit if you cannot put down roots, how do people hop from church to church to church, ministry to ministry to ministry, and expect to grow? They don't. They live off the adrenaline of hopping from place to place to place. They live off of the, the overflow, maybe, of these ministries that they go between. But they don't put down roots. Here's the truth about roots. Roots are made for a certain kind of soil. Amen? I cannot take a palm tree from down here in Florida and go plant it in the Arctic tundra of Alaska and expect it to survive much less thrive. It was made for this kind of soil. It was made for this place. So if I take that and I transplant it to a place it was never meant to be in and expect it to grow, not only will it not grow, it will die. But believers all the time transplant from place to place to place to place. What if God made you to be in the soil in that house, in that church? What if God made you to be somebody who can only grow and thrive here at Victory or at your church back home or wherever it is that God's called you? What if the only place, the only lane that you can successfully run in is the one that he's put you in right now? Well, yeah, but, but it's hard. The soil's rocky. The soil's tough. People have different expectations. There's a lot of pressure, whatever, right? But God made you to thrive there. Only you can thrive there. So if you want to produce fruit, if you want to be able to, to, to take that word in and produce something 30, 60, or 100 times as much, then you need to be able to put down roots. And, and the best way to put down roots is to stay put. Stay put. If you are in a church where you got saved and you got filled with the Holy Ghost and you are growing, don't leave it. Don't leave it. Yeah, but the pastor said something I didn't like. Suck it up. <laughs> Sorry. Suck it up, buttercup. Right? He, he, you don't like it. That's fine. You don't have to like it, but you do have to stay. I will tell you, 32 years in one church, I, can, I cannot list the amount of people who have come through the ministry in, the, in that time that now, on the other side of it, they're not just not thriving, they're barely surviving. Amen? And I know that we couldn't hold all of them. Obviously, we couldn't hold all of them. But, and sometimes even God removes people for our benefit. Right, But there are so many folks who chose to take up their roots and transplant themselves into foreign soil that they weren't meant to be in, and they pay for it, and their kids pay for it, and their marriage pays for it because they're in places God didn't call them to. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to scare anybody, but reality. 
So, the roadside seed. I want to talk about the roadside seed in verse 19. When we hear the word of the kingdom, we have the opportunity for that word to get into our heart or into our soul, that middle part of us, right? He said in verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away. Understanding in the original language this was written in means to put together. Okay, so I'm sure you guys have been in a service before where you've heard a sermon and you're like, you see people just freaking out and enjoying it. Yeah, that's awesome. But you're like, I don't get it. I don't understand. Anybody have that experience? I don't understand it. I don't understand. See, understanding is key to producing fruit. The word of God is powerful. It is a powerful seed. But if I don't understand it, then I don't know how to hold on to it. I don't know how to keep it. So understanding, to put it together, I've got to be able to take what I'm hearing. You need to take what I'm telling you today and be able to understand it and put it together in your life so that you can walk out and make it part of you. And once it becomes part of you, you have to guard it. You have to guard it because the the evil one comes and snatches away what you don't understand. It's a waste. Does that make sense? Uh, Verse 20 and 21 talks about the rocky soil. The word was received and put together within them with joy, right? So he said in verse 20, the one sown with seed on rocky places is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. You guys remember when you heard it and you received it with joy, right? Maybe that word of salvation, you heard it, and you're like, oh, man, that was for me, and your life becomes changed. They receive it with joy. Verse 21, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution occurs... Because of the word, immediately he falls away. So in this example, the person understood the word. They understood it. But then when things got hard because of the word they understood, they're like, I can't do this. I can't handle this. In verse 22, he talks about the seed among the thorns. We had already talked about roots and putting down roots and all that. So seed among thorns in verse 22, uh, it says, The one sowed with seed among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, and the anxiety of the world and deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. The word is put together, it's understood within the heart of a person, but anxiety of the world and deceitfulness of wealth or riches or cares of this world choke the soul, choke the soul. They choke the word that was taken into the soul, and then a lack of fruit comes as a result. Does that make sense? So... I can tell you there are seasons of life where I've been all of these. There are seasons of life where I've heard a word from the Lord and I've received it with joy and then the evil one comes. There's been seasons of life in ministry where, you know, and I've been preaching since I did my first sermon when I was 10 years old. I read it off a page. It wasn't much of a preach, but it was, I read it off a page in front of people, right? And so over the last 28 years that I've been doing ministry, there have been times where I've been in rocky soil, I've been in thorny soil, I've been so worried about money that I can't hear the Lord. Amen? I've been so worried about what else going on in the world around me that I can't hear the Lord. So it's, it's not, this is not to make you feel condemned for being in a real life, in a real world. This is to help you understand that no matter what comes, the word in you is the most important connection that you have to fruitfulness. The only way to bring something alive in this world for the kingdom of God is through the word of God getting in us, becoming part of us, and us fighting off the evil one and fighting off the ability to transplant ourselves and move around wherever we want and fighting off those thorns that come to try to choke us out. But that word is powerful. Understanding that word is what gets it within us and causes fruit to come. So what are the enemies of fruitfulness? or the root cause of unfruitfulness. Number one, in verse 19, failure to apply the word, to understand it. That opens up the door for the enemy to come. All right? The second uh, enemy of fruitfulness is a failure to put down roots, verses 20 and 21. And the third uh, enemy of fruitfulness is a failure to keep the word a higher priority than the cares and riches of this world. These things are going to come against the Word of God in your life. If you're in a house, where a church, where you're getting the Word of God all the time, these are the things that are going to fight that Word in your life. So conversely, what is the catalyst for fruitfulness, according to Matthew 13? The catalyst to enable fruitfulness in your life is understanding. It's understanding. 
In other words, being able to apply the word to yourself in all areas. If you want to produce fruit in your life, you need to be able to do that, okay? Uh, You need to allow the Holy Spirit to do that in you, I should say. When applied to the whole life, the word, the word will devil-proof your heart, right? If the enemy coming and snatching away the word of God in your life, if that is a threat, then the opposite effect of that, of understanding the word and getting it in you and making it part of you, the opposite effect of that is that your life becomes devil-proof. Does that make sense? The enemy, the evil one who wants to come and take from you, he can't just come and take from you whenever he wants. Amen? Have you lived a portion of your journey with the Lord where the enemy, it seemed like he could just do what he wanted? Have you had that experience? Right? When the word gets in you and you have that understanding within you, it devil-proofs your life. The second thing, when, when, when the word is applied to the whole life, it enables us to put down roots that withstand affliction and persecution. He gets so in you that you put down deep, deep roots that enable you to withstand persecution and affliction. Okay, that's what the Word can do. And then the third thing is that it keeps us from being anxious or deceived or choked by the world. All right? Now, I want to lay this foundation for what the Word is. This is important. Now, I want to go to uh, John. Let's see. Let's go to John chapter, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 7. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. So we understand that the seed that gets in our life that enables us to be fruitful is the Word, right? We understand that there are things that are trying to choke that out and steal it from us. But if we will understand the Word, allow the Holy Spirit to put it together within us, then we will, uh, we will become immune to those things. In Matthew 7, uh, Jesus reveals another truth about uh, producing fruit. He says in verse 15, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? You don't go up to a thorn bush and say, I'm going to pull an apple or an orange or grapes off this thing, right? It's, it's a thorn bush. Uh, he says, nor, nor figs from thistles. Verse 17, so every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit, good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. So if we go back to verse 16, you will know them by their fruit. That word fruit in the Greek, it means fruit. I know that's a huge revelation. It means fruit, but in parentheses, this is interesting, it means fruit as plucked. Fruit as plucked. I would like to uh, introduce an idea to you that the fruit that God wants to produce in your life is there so that someone else can pick it. When I was a kid, we lived in a house in the neighborhood, and we had these big apple trees behind our house. And there was a point in the year where it would begin to produce apples. And the apples would... You know, they'd start off small, and they would grow. They'd become green, and then eventually some of them would become red. Um, that apple tree was there so that the apples could be picked from it. Does that make sense? What would happen if you did not pick the apples from the tree, the tree itself would become weighed down. The tree itself would begin to hold that rotten fruit and, w- and would do its best to release it and drop those apples on the ground. But sometimes that rotten fruit would remain upon the tree. And if you leave rotten fruit upon the tree, it can become detrimental to the tree. It's important to us to understand that the fruit that God wants to produce in our life from the Word is is built up to produce in us so that other people can consume it. It's about someone around you pulling that peace off of you, pulling that joy off of you, pulling that faith off of you. Again, it is far easier for us to try to pull a prophecy off of somebody or a a word in tongues or, you know what I'm saying, A, a gift of faith or whatever those supernatural gifts that we like to celebrate. It's much easier to reach for that than to reach for the fruit that God is trying to produce in our life. Every good tree bears good fruit. Now, it's interesting in verse 17, he uses the word good twice. And in, in English, we, we show it as good. We translate it as good. 
But in the Greek, he uses two different words. He uses two different words. So the first one, good, good tree. A good tree is a, a tree that is just good by nature, a beneficial tree. It's a healthy tree, all right? But then it says that he, that tree bears good fruit. The second word for good means beautiful, but it means chiefly good, valuable, or virtuous for use. Valuable or virtuous for use. So a good tree, a healthy tree, is going to produce fruit that is useful. For who? For the tree? The tree doesn't need it. The tree produced it. The tree is producing fruit that is good for someone else. What God produces in your life as fruit is meant to be consumed by others for their benefit. Amen? For their benefit. Again, oh, give me all the prophetic words I can get. Listen, there's a point in your journey with the Lord where I don't want to hear any more prophecy. I want to start holding it in my hands. I want some fruition, right? I, I, love, I love when somebody prophesies to me, and it's the Lord, right? When it's the Lord, there's no air quotes. Other times people prophesy to me, and then I'm like, thank you. I, I trust that your heart is good. Thank you. But that's not the Lord. But, you know, I love it when the Lord prophesies. But I can't live off prophecy. And I certainly cannot sustain those around me off of that. Can't do it. I've tried. I can't do it. And maybe you're better at it than I am, but I, I can't. All right? So a good tree produces good fruit, useful fruit. It has an intrinsic value to it. Then he says in the rest of the verse that a bad tree bears bad fruit. Again, bad and bad in English. In the Greek, two different words. A bad tree is a rotten tree. A bad tree is a worthless tree. What does this imply? When we produce fruit, we produce worth, value. If we do not produce fruit, we are worth less. We are worth less. It doesn't mean that we're not valuable to God. I'm not saying you're not valuable to God. God so loved you that he sent his only begotten son to save you. All right? However, he wants to produce something in your life that is valuable to others, not just to him. Um, let's see, verse 18, a worthless tree, a bad tree, a worthless tree bears bad fruit. The second word for bad is hurtful or evil in effect or influence. Both produce something, but it is about the use of what is produced that makes it valuable. I'm sure you've been around people who have produced evil fruit. That when you pick off of their life, your life gets more complicated. You try to serve off of them and live off of what's coming out of them, and, and it doesn't work for you, right? That's a, that's a worthless tree. It is worthless to you, all right? It's hurtful to you. So he said that. Good trees produce good fruit. Bad trees produce bad fruit. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad, evil, hurtful fruit. Conversely, a bad tree cannot produce good, valuable, virtuous for use, fruit okay so if we are connected to jesus if that word is within us and growing that seed we've put down roots we're starting to put up branches we're starting to produce things on the branches of our life okay if if that is connected to jesus we will be the good tree we will be the good tree if we get disconnected from jesus and i don't mean i don't mean going to hell disconnected i mean we stop connecting to jesus because it's easy to do if you've served in ministry very long, it's very easy to get into the stuff of ministry, the stuff of church, the stuff of trying to reach your friends, right? The, the, the logistics of all that can get in the way, and I start to lose my connection to Jesus. I know the book very well. I've known Jesus for 30 years. But there are times where even I fall into seasons where I'm just doing and doing and doing, and I'm not connecting and connecting and connecting. And so it's very easy for that to happen. So no one is above that potential to disconnect. I don't want what God produces in my life. I don't, want, I don't want to get to a point where he stops producing and then I start producing. And what I produce becomes hurtful or evil toward people. I don't want that. I, and I trust you don't want that either. Okay. Uh, verse, uh, verse 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, we always read that, if you've read this before in church. We always read that, and we're always like, you got to produce something good or you're going to hell. Because we always associate fire with hell, don't we? But most often in Scripture, fire is not actually associated with hell. 
it is actually associated with refinement, purification, purging, right? Like metal. You guys ever watch like Forging and Fire? You watch that? That's a crazy show, man. Those people, those are different kind of people than me. I'll tell you that. Those guys are in there, and they're beating that stuff. They're heating it. I would, I would burn myself just being near it. But these guys are working on this metal. They're trying to make it what they, what they can envision it to be. But in order to do that, they must superheat this metal. They must work on it and, and pound on it. And You know, if, if you were the metal, it would be a very adverse experience to be refined, wouldn't it? If you were that metal thing, that trying to become a knife, go from a, a, a steel rebar into a knife like they do on the show, it's a very adverse process for you. That, that, that metal's not sitting there just living the dream, right? That metal's not like, yes, this is awesome. Pound, pound, pound. Red hot heat. That's not what's happening. It's adverse. So when Jesus says in verse 19 that it's, it's going to be cut down, he says if you aren't fruitful, you're going to be cut down. Number one, who's going to cut you down? God is going to cut you down. So this is why we must produce good fruit. Because if not, God comes in and God says, okay, I've got I've to cut you down. Does this mean he's casting us off into hell? Will he do that to people? Yes, he will. Is that what this specifically is saying? I don't believe so. Uh, so he, he says uh, that you're going to be cut down and cast into the fire. That word cut down in the Greek means frustrated. Isn't that interesting? We, we read it in English as cut down. We picture that slice happening, right? But in fact, he's saying God's going to frustrate you. He's going to frustrate you in what you're producing. I've been there. I've been, I'm telling you right now, after reading that and understanding that, God has absolutely frustrated me sometimes because I was not producing. I wasn't producing good fruit. Maybe I wasn't producing evil fruit, but I was not producing good fruit. So then I get frustrated. I get stuck, and I don't like it, right? And sometimes, sometimes that's me. Sometimes it's the devil. Sometimes it's God. Sometimes frustration can be a good thing. And he says that he is... Uh, that he will cut it down and cast it into the fire. This is interesting. I, I do a lot of the, you've heard me talk about the Greek and stuff. So the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic. The New Testament was written in Greek. I do a lot of that original language study. It helps me understand better. I'm a nerd. I like that stuff. Um, when you get into that, there's this concept. Have you guys heard of a lexicon? Have you heard of that? Lexicon. All right. So it's kind of this regional dictionary of the, all the influences on a word. You know, so for example, in English, uh, a word that has become a regular everyday part of the of English vernacular is like like quesadilla, right? Sure. That's a Spanish word. It's a Spanish word. I say it all the time. All, it's the 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 Hispanic lexicon has influenced my English use of the word quesadilla. Does that make sense? So so that's kind of what a lexicon does. According to the Greek lexicon, the word for fire can mean to purify, and it connects it as a fever purifies. What happens when you're sick in your body? Your body builds up heat and a fever. Why? To try to kill what's making you sick. What if verse 19 is really about Jesus saying to us, hey, if you're not producing good fruit, you're a good tree, but you're not producing good fruit. The Father, our Father God is going to come along and He's going to frustrate you and He's going to put you in a position where you're going to burn up what is keeping you from producing good fruit. That sounds like a work of the Lord. That sounds like a gracious work of the Lord. What a good God. Instead of cutting you down and chucking you in the woodpile. Instead, he frustrates you and he gets you to say, I don't like this. God, what am I producing? I, nothing's coming out of me right now. Nothing good is coming from my life. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to frustrate you and I'm going to burn you up inside so that what is in you that is not good will die. So that what then comes from you will be good fruit. Good fruit. It is his desire that we produce good fruit. I want to go one more passage. Is this okay so far? Yeah. All right. I realize I'm being, I'm being real teachy. Like I said, this is my wheelhouse. So if I get too teachy, somebody raise a hand and ask a question, okay? All right. We're going to go to John 15 real quick. John 15. Am I good on time? Nine minutes. Nine minutes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, good job singing today, man. I like the James Brown moves, too. That was cool. That was good. I like that. That was good. 
I saw it. I, he thought he was hiding on the back row. I saw it. Yeah, that was good. It's on. Nice. Posterity's sake. <laughs> John 15. John 15. Jesus is kind of, he's wrapping up his teaching on the earth. He knows he's going to the cross. He's going to the grave. He's going to rise again. He's preparing his disciples for what's about to come. He says to them in John 15, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. This lines up with what we read in Matthew 7 because he said God would come and cut it down, right? The vine dresser, the husbandman, the, the keeper of the orchard, the keeper of the garden, okay? I'm the vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every br branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. My dad has always said it is a privilege to be pruned by the Lord. It's a privilege. Again, when you're being pruned, it's adverse. But at least it's the Lord that's doing it. And then there's a reason for it. The reason being he wants you to produce more. Because let's face it, as we go, we accumulate junk on the branches sometimes. We grow in areas we shouldn't grow in. So sometimes the Lord has to come along and say, hey, that's not for your journey. Cut it off. Right? Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. The word of God purifies us and cleans us. That seed that we get within ourselves, that the Holy Spirit puts together within us in our understanding, it purifies us. It cleans us. So stay in the word and you'll stay clean. Stay in the word and you'll stay clean. Your ambitions, your motives will stay clean if you stay in the word. You get out of the word, you get off into left field on something, and your ambitions are going to muddy up. Your, your intentions will muddy up. Verse 4, remain in me and I in you just as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself but must remain in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. So remain in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. If you were to take a branch off of a tree and throw it on the ground, cut it, throw it on the ground, what's it going to produce? Nothing. It has no roots. It's not connected to anything life-giving. It's just, it's become waste, right? So he says, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself but must remain in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. If you want to be fruitful in ministry, you need to have a fruitful relationship with Jesus. You need to know Jesus. I don't just mean that you need to know of him as your Lord and Savior. I mean you need to know him in the content of his person. You need to know who he is, the kind of man, the kind of God that he is, how he's different from all the others. You need to know him, all right? Remain in me and I in you. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. Oh, how, do I how do I produce much fruit? I remain in him. I stay connected to him. If I nurture my relationship with Jesus the most, then I will be fruitful. I will. And, and I'm telling you, guys, I've been doing this a long time. I know I'm young and short, and I look even younger. But I'm telling you, it is so easy to get into the stuff of trying to change the world for Jesus that you neglect being with Jesus. It is so easy to, to sing about and preach about Jesus but never talk to him. It's easy. When he puts these gifts in you, and these, it's easy to walk in these gifts and to move in these things and neglect the one who gave it to you. So I just want to warn you. Throw up that red flag. Don't think that you're above that. None of us are above that. I mean, look, look at the disciples. Look at the things P uh, Peter saw, the things Peter saw, the things that Judas saw, and look what they did. Judas betrayed him, even though he saw the dead raised. He saw lepers cleansed. He saw blind people made whole and able to see. He saw all these amazing things, but he neglected that relationship with Jesus. Conversely, Peter denied Jesus and denied Jesus and denied Jesus. But when Jesus came after him, he turned back to Jesus and established that relationship. And that's why we still talk about Peter all these years later. So he said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown away like a branch and dries up. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me, verse 7, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. The cool thing about that is that Jesus is not giving us a magic recipe to get what we want from him like Santa Claus. Right? He's not saying, okay, if you're in me, then you can ask for a Lamborghini, and I'm going to give it to you. That's not what he's saying. 
He's saying, when you're in me and my words are in you, it's going to change what you ask for. And you're going to start asking for the things that I want to give you. And then you will get them. Okay? All right. Okay. So, fruit. Good tree cannot produce bad fruit. A bad tree cannot produce evil fruit. Can't happen. Or good fruit. It cannot happen. So when it comes to fruitfulness in your ministry, the number one thing that you need to focus on is Jesus. Most important thing. Talk to him every day. Talk to him every day. And, and I, I want to say this before we wrap up. When you're in a tough season, when you're in a time where maybe God's not answering your prayers and things are hard and adverse, it's very easy to want to stop talking to Jesus. I'll tell you, I, my dad, his health is declining, and he's, his mind is going, and it's horrible. It's the worst thing in the world to see. And you guys know, you guys remember all the great things he's done here, how he's blessed this house, right? And so much of that is slipping away, and it's horrible. And it's been very hard for me to want to talk to God because I feel like when I talk to him, that's what I want to talk to him about. But then when I talk, he doesn't answer in the way that I want. And so it creates this, you know, the enemy's trying to create a resentment there. It's easy. It's easier to, to get in that mode of, well, God's not giving me what I'm asking for, so I'm just going to push through and do what I keep doing, and then hopefully I'll get through it. It's easy to do that. But if we will remain in Him and let His Word remain in us, if we can just keep going back to Him. You know, uh, I heard somebody say that Job complained a lot to God. If you, read the, if you read the book of Job, Job said some very pointed things to God. Job was not the most holy man in his adversity. But the difference was between him and his friends and his wife who kept murmuring and saying all those things, Job always said them to God. They said them to each other. They never talked to God. Job kept talking to God. So you want to remain, remain fruitful? Connect to Jesus. Get that word in you. Ask the Holy Spirit to, to lead you into all truth and to understand that word so that it becomes part of you. And then hang on to it. Fight for it. Don't let anxiety, don't let the evil one, don't let uh, wealth, don't let anything come in and try to take that word from you. Fight for it. And if you will hold on to that word, you will produce fruit that remains. Amen? And it will be fruit that other people can pull off your life and you won't be lessened by that. Amen? You won't be lessened by that. They will be nourished and God will keep producing in you over and over again fruit to replace it. Does that make sense?